The governor outlines his plans when it comes to decriminalizing recreational marijuana. Hear from him and reaction from those opposed. Divers have found the body of the second person in that semi that plunged 10 stories into the lake yesterday morning. Plus, after record-breaking snowfall, communities all across Wisconsin are running out of space, which has us asking, where does all this snow go? From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 6. And thanks for joining us. Governor Tony Evers announced his plan to legalize medical marijuana and decriminalize possession of pot in small amounts. He hopes this is one of the first steps towards shrinking the racial disparities in our criminal justice system. Amanda Quintana is here with more on what the governor's proposal could mean, Amanda. Yes, well, this would make both medical marijuana and CBD legal in Wisconsin. For medical marijuana, a doctor would need to recommend a patient, someone suffering with a debilitating medical condition that includes cancer, chronic pain, severe nausea, or PTSD. To get CBD oil, you wouldn't need a doctor's certification. In addition to medical use, Governor Evers is proposing decriminalizing marijuana under 25 grams. He's calling this a small but critical piece to addressing racial inequities. Wisconsin has the highest incarceration rate in the country for black men and drug-related offenses account for a significant proportion of those inmate populations. The proposal also includes establishing a procedure for those who have already been convicted of possessing, manufacturing, or distributing less than 25 grams of marijuana to have their records expunged if they've completed their sentence. This piece on decriminalizing the drug is where Republicans say the proposal goes too far. Speaker Robin Voss sending us this statement saying Evers proposal appears to go too far. It makes it easier to get recreational marijuana and provides a pathway to full legalization which I do not support. When asked in the past, Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald has said he does not support legalizing medical marijuana and he doesn't see his fellow Republicans supporting it either. So I'm not sure if this is really going to get through. We'll continue to follow it. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Some Dane County voters will head to the polls tomorrow for the 2019 spring primary. There are no statewide contests on the ballot, but there are several big local races like Mayor of Madison. You're looking at a few of the candidates here. Also, Madison School Board and Fitchburg City Council. This will be the first time that Dane County will have both Spanish and English ballots at every polling place as well. The general election is April 2nd. And you can find out more about the Madison mayoral candidates and Tuesday's election at channel3000.com. Turning to weather now, let's check in with Gary Canalti. Gary? Well, Susan, we're in between storms. We had one yesterday that brought over five inches of snow to the Madison area, and we may see a similar storm uh, for tomorrow, or late tomorrow night into Wednesday. A visible cloud track, you can see uh, pretty quiet across much of the upper Midwest, just a few mid and high level clouds coming in from the west. As we take a look at Doppler track, just a little bit of light snow downwind from Lake Michigan. Otherwise, we have alert days in the forecast for late tomorrow night into Wednesday for occasional snow that could accumulate two to five inches by Wednesday night. And then another storm system from late Saturday afternoon into Sunday will start out with snow, sleet, freezing rain and rain, changing to snow on Sunday with some additional accumulations. Low temperatures this morning, generally in the uh, middle teens here in uh, southern Wisconsin. High temperatures mid 20s to around 30. Current temperatures now have dropped into the upper teens and by tomorrow morning, look for those temperatures to gradually drop into the single digits above zero. Winds will be light, so not much of a wind chill. Tomorrow's high temperature 24. That is your News 3 Now First Alert forecast. All right, thank you, Gary. The snow keeps coming down, and that means the snow piles are getting higher and higher. But all that snow has to go somewhere, right? Jamie Prez is here to explain where it ends up after plows clear it from the sides of our roads. Jamie? Right, well, snow crews cannot get all of the snow off the side of the roads. There's just simply too much of it, but they certainly do what they can to make visibility while driving as clear as possible. This is basically all you can do as a homeowner when there's too much snow on the ground. My mother-in-law taught me how to snow blow, so thanks to Julie for that. Thanks, Julie, but all this snow is creating some visibility issues on the roads. Exactly. Yeah, it's terrifying. Snow piles that look like hills. How can anyone see past this, right? Yeah, they, they've been really bad. Turning corners is basically a guessing game. It's been kind of scary. And when you're left to figure it out blindly... It sucks. Yes, it does. And the city can only do so much, though, which which means the rest is left to residents like Elena here. It's only so high that you can actually like throw the snow and 
Like that one there is definitely taller than I am. And this one taller than I am. But this is actually the dump site where city crews dump all of the extra snow from problem areas of city owned streets. Unfortunately, these sites are not accessible to the public. There's nowhere else to put it. Right. Homeowners are running out of space on their own yards, but the city also can't possibly get every mound of snow that you see piled up on the sides of the roads. Moving snow is never easy. I know. But did you know that if you see a snow pile that's creating some visibility issues on city owned streets, you can actually report that and the city will come clear it for you. I did not know that. That is useful to know. For the rest of it, your best bet is to pile it in the center of your lawn to make visibility as clear as possible. It's a pain in the butt. <laughs> Yes, it is. And if you want the link to that website where you can actually report those problem area snow piles, I have a link to that on our website at channel3000.com. All right, Jamie Perez on the backyard has some great information there. Jamie, thank you. Now with four snow emergencies in four weeks now, the cost of removing all this is starting to run much higher than expected. Madison City officials say the average cost of one snow emergency is $250,000. The city has already spent the $2.5 million budgeted to last through the end of April. They're expecting to exceed a $6.2 million snow and ice removal budget by about $640,000. The snow budget is a, you know, is a good example of something the weather we cannot control. And so we try to do um, our best with setting enough dollars aside to meet it and then also having money in reserve. Although the city has surpassed the five and a half snow events it planned on, after today's snow emergency, streets will continue to be cleared as usual with anticipation of four more snow events this season. The search for the second person involved in a, the semi that went off Interstate 90 into Mirror Lake on Sunday morning is over. Crews found the body of a woman this afternoon. Officials are also identifying the body of the man recovered from the lake yesterday. Our Madeline O'Neill brings us more from Sauk County near Wisconsin Dells. I'm standing here on Mirror Lake where divers have successfully recovered the body of the second person involved in Sunday morning's semi truck crash off the interstate. Very dedicated group of guys, a lot of training, a lot of hours for missions like this. A terrifying situation is ending with the completion of a difficult search. Just the biggest challenge is equipment freeze up. Of course, your divers are cold when they come out of the water. Mike Stoddard, commander of Sauk County's dive team, says after starting the search at 9 Monday morning, divers braving the chilly water found the body of a woman at about 12.45 in the afternoon. She is believed to be the second person in the semi-truck that plunged about 10 stories off the interstate into the water Sunday. We had three divers in today. This was our third diver that was in. We probably had a total of close to 40 minutes of bottom time. So probably about 40 minutes of search and we located her. Crews shut down I-90 going east to recover the semi-truck and trailer Sunday, along with the body of a man now identified as 39-year-old Timothy Green of Kentucky. The woman found by divers here Monday has not yet been identified. We put them in a systematic search pattern. They're on a rope. We got communications with them from the surface. But even with extensive training, Stoddard says finding a body can take a toll. That's definitely, uh, you know, something that we deal with, not only just diving, but in this, in law enforcement, that's something we deal with all the time. And Reporting on Mirror Lake, Madeline O'Neill, News 3 Now. The Department of Transportation says they'll look into whether there are feasible options to make safety improvements on I-90 after the crash reconstruction and the investigation. But as of now, the agency says the area is not a high crash location. One man is in jail after a shooting in the village of Clinton last night. Police arrested 18-year-old Jesus Rangel. Officers were called to a home at 727 Milwaukee Street last night for reports of a disturbance. They say an 18-year-old woman was shot. A gun was found in a snowbank. The woman is expected to survive. There is a push to get more care for senior citizens in Wisconsin. And a new brewery in Madison hopes to pay it forward how ordering a pint or two can help those in our community. That story just ahead.
Advocacy groups are trying to get more money to help care for Wisconsin's elderly population. Those advocates say nearly 400 Wisconsin nursing facilities are at a crisis because of a shortage of workers and the state's low Medicaid reimbursement rate. Now, health care organizations are asking lawmakers to set aside $83 million to help facilities cover costs and avoid closures over the next two years. Just since 2016, 27 skilled nursing facilities have closed, including eight so far this year. An interim principal has been named at Beloit Memorial High School after Orlando Ramos resigned from his position last week. Emily Pels, the district's executive director of special education, will be serving as the school's interim principal for the rest of the school year. Ramos, who was placed on administrative leave February 7th, was in his first year as principal there when he resigned last week. The district did not confirm what led to Ramos being placed on leave, saying that move was a personnel matter. The Madison Police Department would like your help when it comes to the safety in your neighborhood. The department is inviting you to join them at High Point Church tonight on Old Sock Road. To learn more about the Madison Police Department's Good Neighbor Projects, those projects are part of a community safety program put on by the department to help you get to know your community and the officers who protect it. Tonight, you'll be able to learn more from other members and the MPD Crime Prevention Unit if you'd like to attend, the event starts at 6.30. A new microbrewery opened in Madison this afternoon, but its owner says it's a microbrewery with a conscience. Delta Beer Lab's business model emphasizes social commitment. That includes donating tips to different nonprofits every month, giving 1% back to the environment, and paying its employees a living wage of $12.44 per hour. I think that it's important for our staff to work for our mission. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is make sure that they're a part of it. Tim says paying a living wage only adds about a dollar to the price of each beer sold. More snow is on the way, if you can believe it, later this week. Gary's tracking another storm headed our way. That's next in the First Alert forecast.
Tonight at 10, we'll learn more about something called the Internet of Things. And some are calling it part of the next great industrial revolution. We'll tell you exactly how experts in the field define it and show you how it's already a big part of life all around us. We'll profile a local company putting it to use and show you how the UW system colleges and industries around the state are collaborating to make sure students can fill those jobs when they graduate. We see a lot of um, you know, larger, very well-established companies you know, in that spot of, hey, we, we've heard of the Internet of Things. We feel like we need to do something in the Internet of Things, but we don't really understand how that's going to affect our business. The response from industry was just overwhelming. That Yes, I want to be part of this. Count us in. This is a different so the Internet of Things. We'll tell you what it is. It's impact on Wisconsin education and jobs tonight on News 3 at 10. Interesting. Looking forward to that. And weather plays a big role in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll see, you know, being able to predict things into the future and being able to automate things based on weather conditions, all part of the Internet of Things. So I'm looking forward to that story. I don't think we're looking forward to the forecast, though. No, a day to shovel out before more is on the way, right? Oh, boy, I just you know, finished blowing off the driveway okay. this morning, and uh, fortunately I've got some gas in the snowblower for the next round, which is tomorrow night. Now, right now things are pretty quiet. Some lake effect snows downwind from Lake Michigan into northwestern Indiana, but the rest of the Midwest is clear. But already winter storm watch has been issued from tomorrow night into Wednesday for Monday of Iowa into southeastern Minnesota and west central Wisconsin, just north and west of La Crosse. The GFS computer model showing about uh, six to seven inches of snow through that area, uh, probably somewhere in the two to five inch range through much of southern Wisconsin where we are, and then maybe a little lesser amounts over southeastern Wisconsin. But that's only the first storm system because we have another storm system toward the end of the week and into the weekend, bringing the potential for more snow. Uh, the very latest computer model runs, and this is a change even from last hour. You can see puts the heaviest snow from that second storm farther to the north and west. It had Madison last time uh, a little over 12 inches with uh, the heaviest snow on Sunday uh, in this area, but now it shifted a little farther to the north and west, which is good because that's what the European computer model was showing as well. So maybe that's lessened the threat for a heavy snow uh, on Sunday, but even with that, there's also the possibility for some freezing rain, and we could be looking at somewhere between a tenth and maybe as much as two tenths of an inch of freezing rain in some areas before that changes over to snow from late Saturday afternoon and Saturday night into early Sunday morning. So we have an alert day in the forecast for late tomorrow night into Wednesday for about two to five inches of snow, very similar to what we saw from this last storm system, and then the next system bringing a mix of precipitation from late Saturday afternoon into Saturday night, and then changing over to snow on Sunday with some accum accumulations expected on Sunday. Sunday. The live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison. Skies are actually clear out there. It's a pretty nice evening, although on the cold side. High today did make it up to 26 after starting out at 14, but right now we're just above that at 17. Skies are clear, the air is calm, and with light winds and uh, relatively clear skies for much of the night, temperatures will probably drop to just above zero by early tomorrow morning. Strong, energetic jet stream continues across the central part of the country. The next weather disturbance that will bring us the snow starting to gather strength to the south and west. The main area of low pressure is actually sitting back in southern Colorado, so it'll take a while to get here. Late tomorrow night into Wednesday is our best chance for snow, but it's got to get past this area of high pressure first. And notice the north to northwesterly winds generally on the light side, but that'll continue to bring down cold air for tonight. Current temperatures are generally in the teens and single digits to our north and west, 20s to the south, but notice with the light winds, look at the wind chills, very similar to the temperatures, so we're not seeing a big drop off, at least according to wind chills. Now, as we take a look at the future track computer model, you can see things pretty quiet for tonight into tomorrow with partly cloudy skies, but then by tomorrow night the clouds start to thicken up and then the snow starts to arrive late tomorrow night into Wednesday. It'll snow for much of the day on Wednesday before that storm system lifts to the north and east and then notice the winds shift back to a more west and northwesterly direction. Temperatures though should be pretty typical for this time of year behind that storm system. So Thursday and Friday look to be relatively quiet days. Our forecast for tonight calls for skies to be partly cloudy by morning. Low temperature drop to two degrees above zero. Light and variable wind so we're not looking at much of a wind chill even though it will be on the cold side. For tomorrow, look for partly sunny skies, very typical, very similar to today with a high temperature of 24 degrees. Now, in future track, look for quiet conditions tonight. That'll allow temperatures to drop pretty quickly down into the single digits above and below zero to our north and west by early tomorrow morning. Light winds, wind chills should be much of a factor. Partly sunny tomorrow with high temperatures in the mid 20s. Then tomorrow night, the clouds thicken up by morning. The snow overspreads much of southern Wisconsin. Temperatures actually rise a little bit tomorrow night. And then look for temperatures up around the freezing mark on Wednesday with uh, much of the snow uh, probably ending late in the afternoon or at least tapering down to flurries. As far as snowfall amounts, probably about two to five inches through much of southern Wisconsin, lesser amounts to our south and east, heavier amounts to our north and west. 10-day forecast, 
Once we get past that storm, we got the other one for, uh, with mixed precipitation to snow Saturday night into Sunday, and then another system in the middle of next week to so bring some more accumulating snow. There's Monday night basketball at the Cold Center, and the Badgers want to keep a long winning streak going. We'll have a live report coming up in sports. Hi, I'm Michelle Carolla. Tonight on the News at 9, do you know what it takes to be a good neighbor? Police are helping neighborhoods to stay safe. We'll explain that first on Fox at 9. The Badger men's basketball team dropped two spots to 22nd in today's Associated Press poll. Tonight, Wisconsin plays Illinois at the Kohl Center at 7 on FS1. The Badgers have beaten Illinois 12 straight times, but the Illini come to Madison with a four-game winning streak of their own. To the Kohl Center we go, where Melissa Kim joins us live with a preview of the Badgers and the Illini. All right, good evening, Melissa. Well, hey there, Jay. Yeah, if you feel like it's been a really long time since you've seen the Badgers play in a game, that's because it's been a really long time since the Badgers played the game. The last time they played was almost a week ago on Tuesday when they lost to Michigan State here at the Kohl Center. So they've had quite a bit of time off since then. Uh, so have they been using that time to their advantage? Well, the, at least Illinois hasn't had any time off, at least. But also, this isn't the fighting Illini team of years past. They won four straight games, including a win over Michigan State two weeks ago. But the Badgers hoping that this mini break helped them readjust and refocus, especially those younger players. You know, everyone in the Big Ten right now is feeling it a little bit in their bodies and their legs. So it's, you know, it's good to get a little break. Um, and, you know, like she said, uh, hit, hit the reset and get a little... Um, freshness under you before you attack, you know, the back half of the schedule. We're getting a lot more guys on the um, on our side of the ball, so um, bringing up some of those younger guys and getting them some experience and um, just seeing their growth, really, <clears throat> from the first month that they got here um, has really improved. 
Now, one thing about Brad Davison, he's played particularly well against Illinois throughout his Badger career. In the three games that he's played against them, he's always scored in double digits. So, not like you're not going to be able to spot him on the floor anyways. He is that one-man hype squad that gets really energetic all the time. But definitely keep an eye out for him tonight, Jay. All right. That's Melissa Kim live at the Kohl Center. Thanks. Well, we haven't heard much from Packers head coach Matt LaFleur since he was introduced in Green Bay in January. Today, LaFleur was back in front of the microphone to talk about his new coaching staff. Luke Getze is the quarterback's coach, and Nathaniel Hackett, the offensive coordinator, with LaFleur as head coach. Aaron Rodgers is going to get plenty of guidance if he needs it. LaFleur says he'll be very active in overseeing and helping Rodgers. I think it's it's great. We've got three quarterback guys that are going to be hitting them from all angles. But, uh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do my part. I, I know I need to be in that room, especially... Uh, as much as I possibly can, because I am going to be the play caller. I think that relationship between the play caller and the quarterback is absolutely critical. Um, so I will be in there as, as as much as I can. I don't I don't foresee ever missing a quarterback meeting. Our next prep media game of the week is tomorrow night. Boys basketball in the Big Eight. Sun Prairie visits Madison LaFala. John Boyle and I bring in the game live on Channel 3000.com, 7:15 tomorrow night. And in the NBA All-Star game last night in Charlotte, this is the play everyone's still talking about. Steph Curry's bounce pass to Giannis on Dedekupo. Giannis caught the ball three feet over the basket and slammed it home. Giannis led everyone 38 points, but his team lost to Team LeBron. 178-164. The two teams took 167 three-point shots in the game. The Bucks returned to regular season action Thursday, hosting. Boston. I'd like to do it's that even, just once. Even better when you slow it down like that. It just kind of mm. became an opportunity for the world to see what he can yeah. do. Defense was optional. But, yes. you know, <laughs> as always, <laughs> always, <laughs> always in the, yeah. that game. All right, final check, Gary. Well, we got some snow on the way for tomorrow, about two to five inches, actually late tomorrow night into Wednesday morning. Heavier amounts out toward the lacrosse area. 10-day forecast, another storm system late Saturday into Sunday. Some mixed precipitation changing to snow, and then another one in the middle of next week. Right. Gary, thank you. Thanks for joining us for News Street 6. Have a good night, everybody. See you back here tonight at 10.